We spoke in the last session about rabbinic law, about the dynamism and innovation of Torah from Moses to Joshua. What then? How did Torah go from Moshe and Joshua until today, or at least until the codification of the Oral Torah? So that's the subject of this session. We're not going to cover it all. Again, it is a vast subject, but we're going to try to take a hefty bite into it. So Moshe innovated some laws, of course, within his jurisdiction, within his mandate, within the power vested in him by God. Joshua did the same. And these laws joined the main body of oral Torah. They were publicized. They were disseminated throughout the nation. And they joined the corpus of oral Torah that was transmitted from generation to generation. The Torah, again, is still in a written Torah. It's entirely written. In fact, you cannot read the written Torah by heart. And then with oral Torah, it's entirely oral. And you cannot teach the oral Torah from a book. And they're concurrently being transmitted accurately from generation to generation. And of course, this raises skepticism and this raises questions. How do we know that we did a good job? Or more precisely, what safety measures were instituted? What ordinances were in place to ensure that the Torah that we have today, the Torah that was perpetual without generations, is indeed free of error? So, of course, we have to ask the question about the written Torah. Maybe the text was altered. How do we know that it was accurate? And, of course, that question also applies to the oral Torah as well. How do know the oral Torah is perpetuated accurately? Now, this is a subject that we're going to still discuss in future episodes. But I want to talk about it a little bit because it's going to help us understand what is the nature of Torah from Moses to the Mishnah, from Moses until the codification of the oral Torah. So there are many laws and safety measures in place to ensure that the written Torah is not going to be altered. To write a written Torah, you can't read a written Torah from a book. You have to copy it by hand. And there are many security factors that are in place to ensure that the Torah, the written Torah, is perpetuated accurately. So if you add a letter or you subtract a letter, there's many letters in the Torah, 300, 4,000, 8, or 5 letters in the Torah. If one of them is missing, or one is added, or one is worn off, or two are touching, or there's a hole in the parchment, or there's a smudge or a smear, the Torah is invalidated. And you have to fix it, or you have to archive it. The scribe has to be pious, has to be learned. All the materials have to be prepared specially for the purpose of writing a Torah scroll. Even the most gifted Torah scribe cannot rely on memory. You can't copy the Torah by heart. You have to have a second Torah scroll open in front of you at all times. You have to enunciate a word before you write it. You can play around with the layout with the various sections of the Torah. If there are mistakes, you have to immediately fix them or you have to put away, even bury a Torah scroll. I've been in shuls where they're reading the Torah scroll on Shabbos and you find a mistake, right away you have to close the Torah scroll and you have to get another Torah scroll, and the reading that you did is invalidated, you have to get another Torah scroll to read from it. Of course, Moshe, at the end of his life, the Torah tells us, he gives the written Torah, or copies of the written Torah, to the Jewish people. The Talmud tells us that he actually wrote 13 Torah scrolls. He gave one to each of the 12 tribes, and a 13th scroll was kept for posterity in the Ark, in the Holy of Holies, together with many other important items, such as the tablets, both the tablets that were destroyed and the other tablets, and many other things like the vial of manna, Aaron's staff that bloomed with almonds. And whenever there was a question, whenever there was a dispute as to how to spell a word, whenever there was discrepancies between two Torah scrolls, you would always have the fallback. You just go back to Moshe's Torah scroll. That we know for sure is accurate. And you check to see which one of your versions is indeed true. Every tribe had their Torah scroll and all the scribes from that particular tribe would use that as the source scroll to make their scroll. So they would copy from that one. And because it's distributed, every tribe has their own scroll And occasionally, over the course of our history, 
they would gather all the Torah scrolls and compare them and weed out mistakes that inevitably fell into the text. And therefore, we can be assured that the text of the Torah that we have today is indeed the text that Moshe gave us. In fact, if you compare it to other religions, other religions have in their texts hundreds of thousands of variations and the most you would find in any two Torah scrolls, the most that they would differ is in nine letters, which out of 304,805 letters is infinitesimally tiny. But even those nine letters, they are what's called chaserot and yeserot, meaning they are letters that are vowels. Sometimes the vowels appear in a word. Sometimes they don't appear in a word. And therefore, even those nine discrepancies do not change a word. And this, of course, is great testament to the fact that the written Torah was indeed perpetuated accurately. In fact, in the 20th century, they found versions of the Torah scrolls that were 2,000 years old. And of course, everyone is gleefully ready to show how we have altered all kinds of stuff over the course of the centuries and millennia. But then they actually took pictures of it, and they were precisely, exactly like the Torah scrolls we have today. So if we've done 2,000 years perpetuating the Torah, the written Torah, accurately, even though we've been scattered throughout the world, even though we've been subject to all kinds, all manners of persecution, and we don't have access to Moshe's original 13 Torah scrolls, it's safe to assume it would be quite logical and reasonable to say that indeed the Torah that we have today, the text written Torah, is 100% accurate and is the one that Moshe delivered to the Jewish people on the day of his passing. That's an easier subject. What about the Oral Torah? How was the Oral Torah, which again, we don't have anything physical to ensure accuracy, how was that transmitted accurately? And the question that people always ask, or certainly people that have less familiarity with Torah, the question that they ask is, well, Have you never played the game of telephone? Don't you know if you have to pass information, it gets distorted, it gets changed, and the longer the chain is, the more it gets distorted? And that's a silly question. Not because it's a silly subject, it's a very important subject, but of course, the game of telephone and how Torah is being transmitted could not be more different. And I want to say, by way of introduction, the question of how we transmitted Torah accurately, oral Torah accurately, I think it's mostly a product of our microscopic standards of Torah scholarship. We have very low standards today. I wonder what percentage of the Jewish people can actually name just the name of the 54 parshios in the Torah. What percentage of our nation actually knows the names of Bereshus Noach, Lech HaVayir, Chaisara, Toldus Vayetze, the 54 names of the sections of the Torah? If you do it, you're probably part of the 1%. That's our standards of scholarship today. Historically, we have had tremendously high standards of scholarship. Talmud tells us, Book of Kedushin, page 30a, Vishinantem, this is from the Shema. You should teach Torah to your children. It explains the Talmud. If someone asks you a Torah question, what is demanded of every Jew is to respond immediately. To have such clarity of knowledge of Torah, to not have to even file, go find that file in your head or Google it to know it right away. Of course, that's a high standard that we maybe strive to attain. And that was standard centuries ago. But even today, I personally know people that know it all instantly. I have an uncle, my father's sister's husband. He made it his mission as a very young man to be the rabbi that knows it all instantly without fumbling. And the story behind that is interesting. He was once at a wedding and there were many rabbis who were in attendance and the father of the groom had a heart attack and died under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy. And he said that the rabbis were so flustered by this. What do we do now? that he couldn't believe it. He's like, wait, there's, there's rabbis here and they don't know right away what to do? I'm going to be the rabbi that does know always instantly what to do without having to research it. And my uncle is a rabbi in Israel. 
and he's not the most famous rabbi. He's not the most renowned rabbi. He is a rabbi, and yet you could read any page of Talmud, any page of Talmud. Open up, a, a, he'll, he'll turn around. You open up any one of the 36 books, and you read from any one of the 2,711 pages, and you read any line, and I'll tell you what page of Talmud it's on. And there are hundreds of people just like him. I think if the people who ask the telephone question, if they knew people like him, they wouldn't be so flippant about as if Torah is this one thing that you say quickly, you mutter into your friend's ear, and it's going to easily be forgotten. The standards of Torah scholarship that we have had historically and even still exist to some extent today are a lot higher than these questioners. The Rambam, he is famous for telling us that everyone has to work. Don't just be a Torah scholar who studies Torah and relies on the largesse of the public. You have to work. But how much should you work and how much should you study Torah? The Ram says you should study Torah for nine hours a day and you should work for three hours a day and the other 12 hours do all the other things they need to do. This is the Ramah. I'm talking about a working person. Certainly, if this was the standard, can you imagine, again, for someone who's not a Torah scholar, who's not a sage, if the average person is studying nine hours of Torah a day, would we have a problem transmitting the oral Torah accurately? I would imagine not. So I think that's the first perspective to adopt when trying to navigate the question of how was Torah perpetuated accurately over the course of the millennia. Moreover, what is being transmitted? It's not ideas divorced from reality. It's not something, some secret that no one knows, some arcane insight, some esoteric principle that no one really knows, and you're the guardian of that principle, you pass it over to the next generation. You're transmitting a way of life. Torah is the instruction that might give us that we are maintaining, that we are doing, that we are practicing, not some story or some discreet idea. How do we know, I heard this example once from a rabbi several years ago, how do we know that when you get to a green light, you're supposed to go, when you get to red, when you get to red light, you're supposed to stop? Is this something that you read in a book? You imagine it's not something you read in a book. It's it's life. Everyone knows that. My kids know that. My four-year-old son knows that. Maybe even my one-year-old daughter knows that. I don't know. I have to ask her. Everyone knows when it's a green light, you go. When it's a red light, you stop. Every Jewish child knows that daddy has tzitzis on his garment that you're supposed to kiss. And every child knows that on Shabbos we don't flip on the lights. And every child knows that on circus we sit in the sukkah. And on Pesach we eat matzah. And the highest ideal of Jewish living, the greatest pastime of the Jewish people, is to study Torah. Every child knows that. It's alive. It's not like we're transmitting ideas. We're living it. And a Jewish child who is fortunate enough to be surrounded in a Torah environment, they absorb it from the first day they are born. And another point. This is the national mission of the Jewish people. The national mission of the Jewish people is to perpetuate Torah throughout the generations and to maintain the accuracy of Torah despite all the tribulations that we may endure as a nation. This is not some word, some message that you're trying to say it as quickly and as most, you know, in the most garbled fashion as possible to try to see how crazy the idea could evolve over the course of 30 kids. There was an individual who made a study. He took 30 kids and he said, we're going to play telephone. But this is a different game of telephone. In this game of telephone, or it's called broken telephone, I think. In this game of broken telephone, if the message is perpetuated accurately from person one to person 30, everyone gets 50 bucks. Ah, let's change the states. What happens now? So he gave the word to kid one. Who gave it to kid two? Who gave it to kid three? Who gave it to kid four? And guess what? By kid 30, the message was delivered intact. And everyone got their 50 bucks. If the objective is to transmit it accurately, then it's more likely to be perpetuated accurately. 
And you know what? How many generations have there been from Moses to the Mishnah? It's actually not that long. There's only 40 generations from Moses to the end of the Talmud, which is about 300 years after the Mishnah. So it's roughly around 30 generations. If 30 kids could do it, 30 generations were the greatest minds in human history focused solely on study of Torah or primarily on study of Torah, the most important national mission of the Jewish people to perpetuate accurately, can't you imagine that it would be done well or perfectly? Is that too much of a stretch to ask? But there's another important point. There is a body, there is an institution whose goal whose reason why they exist is to quickly resolve any discrepancies or disputes. And that, of course, is the Sanhedrin. And this is a body that is established by Moses himself. We read in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 16, God tells Moshe, gather 70 elders. And this is the forebearer of the Sanhedrin. 70 elders plus Moshe, we have 71 elders. And this body is going to be extant until the middle of the fourth century of the Common Era. For a stunning 1,700 years, almost uninterrupted, we're going to have the Sanhedrin. And they're going to be there to weed out mistakes, to mitigate mistakes, and to establish halacha. Whenever there's a dispute, whenever there's an uncertainty, you go to the Sanhedrin, and they are the guardians. They are the last word of oral Torah, and any question is resolved by them. And in fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, when a matter is hidden from you, between blood and blood, between law and law, between nega, which means like a like a, like an affliction and an affliction, matters of dispute in your towns. You don't know something. Rabbi A says one thing, Rabbi B says another thing. There's uncertainty. There is ignorance of a given matter. Vekamta Velisa, you should get up and ascend to the place, i.e. to Jerusalem, where God chose, and you go. And you speak to the elders, to the priests, to the Levites, to the judges that exist in that day. And you'll study the matter, and they'll give you a ruling, and you must obey that ruling. And if you don't obey that ruling... If you depart from the ruling right or left, that person who refuses to accept the ruling is actually going to be executed. If there is a renegade sage, if there is a recalcitrant judge who refuses to accept the ruling of Sanhedrin, they are liable to be executed. So we have a body, the Sanhedrin. They are the safety measure to ensure that mistakes, if they do happen, they're not likely to happen, but if they do, we have a way to resolve the problems. And, of course, in the absolute majority of instances, the questions would not reach the Great Sanhedrin. You asked your friends, you asked your local rabbi, you asked the lower courts, and even in the Sanhedrin itself, the complex of the temple, there were two lower courts, and most likely they would be resolved there. And if not, you come to Sanhedrin, and their ruling is law. Now, I want to just throw something out there. If there was a mistake, if Sanhedrin made an erroneous ruling, that might not be so bad. We'll talk more about that in a future session. But again, the question is a legitimate question. How was oral Torah perpetuated throughout the years? And we see it's not so simple for us to take the infantile position, well, a game of telephone, it's distorted in a million different ways. Oh no, it was actually transmitted quite accurately. We would argue perfectly accurately, accurately throughout the generations. And if there were mistakes, that might not be somebody like we'll talk about in the future. But we do get something really interesting. There are no records of mistakes or misunderstandings until right before the mission was written. In fact, the Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 94b, tells us that there was a great national census in the time of King Chistio, the 13th king of Judah. This is at the time where Chistio was being threatened by Sancherib, the king of the Assyrians. And Chistio was worried that the reason why they were under threat was due to the fact that they had been a little bit negligent in, in study of Torah. He took a sword, 
and he went to the house of scholarship and he made a threat. He says, if you don't study Torah, I'm going to kill you. And then they made a census from Dan to Beersheba and they did not find a single ignoramus. And they did not find a young boy or even a young girl, a man or a woman, that was not a total expert in the laws of purity and impurity. So again, we have this tremendous period of time where mistakes are just not appearing because the system is so tight. It's so strong. The culture of Torah study, the immersion of Torah study, and all the safety measures that are in place and all Torah is being perpetuated accurately. And in addition, way before the actual writing of the Mishnah, the canonization of the Oral Torah, or even the canonization of the Tanakh, of the Jewish Bible, there were some efforts to begin to codify Oral Torah. So for example, every leader of every generation, and of course every student, had Notes, maintained voluminous notes. And again, oral Torah, you have to teach it orally. You're not allowed to publicly use your notes. You're not allowed to disseminate your notes as authoritative oral Torah. But this system of note building and making sure that you're including every new insight, every new understanding, every new connection between written Torah and oral Torah, every new decree and ordinance, every new decision rendered by the Sanhedrin, this note building actually created a tremendous body of written oral Torah. It wasn't codified, but it's going to be crucial for the eventual writing of the Mishnah many centuries hence. I read at the very beginning, at the time of Joshua and the time of the judges, that process begins in earnest. Moreover, there was an intensive effort to organize and to systematize Torah. And the benefit of this is is tremendous. You know, the Torah, it's distributed, of course, over the five books of the Torah. But the oral Torah, there's a lot of details that are not necessarily organized. So we're told in the Talmud, this is the Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Shkalem, chapter 5, law number 1. It quotes a verse in, in Chronicles that talks about a family of counters. What does it mean, a family of counters? This was a family that their innovation in oral Torah was to try to organize it and to say, okay, there are five people, for example, that cannot separate truma. What this means is they're taking various laws that may be distributed, scattered throughout oral Torah and putting it into a place and giving it a number and putting it in a box, making it more memorizable, making it more organized, making it more accessible making it easier to perpetuate. There's five people that cannot bring truma. There's five things that are needed in challah. There's 15 women that are so prohibited to their yavam that they actually absolve their co-wives. And these, by the way, are all included in the Mishnah. There's 36 prohibitions in the Torah that have within it the punishment of Chrysos. There are four general categories of personal damages. There are 40 minus one things that are prohibited on Shabbos. Again, they're giving numbers and organizing things to make it easier to perpetuate. This is, of course, going to be included in the codification of the Oral Torah. But again, we see the the early nascent efforts to begin to make Oral Torah more digestible for the common folk. So we have Torah being perpetuated Torah being organized, and in every generation, the leaders of the generation and their courts are adding decrees and ordinances, again, as sanctioned by the Torah, within the jurisdiction, within the power vested in the Torah, in the Sanhedrin, in the requirement to make fences, etc. So, a quick sampling of these laws that were added to the oral Torah throughout generations. Boaz, he is one of the judges, he instituted, for example, the greeting of Shalom which is one of the names of God, that's how you greet a fellow Jew. That comes from Boaz. There's all kinds of prayers that are added to liturgy over the course of the centuries. That itself could be its own subject that we could talk about. Samuel, he's the one who promulgated the law that a non kohen may slaughter sacrifices. Some have suggested, in fact, that this is one of the laws that was forgotten during Moses' passing. It was Samuel's court 
that finally settled the question of a female Ammonite and Moabite convert. He was the one who made sure, finally, that David indeed is allowed to be incorporated the Jewish people, even though his great-grandmother Ruth was a Moabite convert. And he was the one who differentiated between male and female converts. Male converts cannot marry the Jewish people, male Ammonite and Moabite converts, that is, whereas females can. David's court, they added prayers and blessings. The fact that there are 100 blessings that we're supposed to say every day, that comes from David. Yichud, the law prohibiting the seclusion of a man with a woman other than his wife, that too came from David's court. In the times of Solomon, the laws of Eruv were developed. The additional relatives not prohibited by the Torah, that came also in the times of Solomon. They were added as a protective fence to the Torah-prohibited relationships. And the fact that we say the Kohanic blessing, this is, of course, the three verses in Numbers that the priests are supposed to pray and bless the Jewish people, that was installed in daily prayers in the times of Solomon. The aforementioned King Chizkiah, he decreed that idols render ritual impurity. When Sancherib encircled Jerusalem, he composed a prayer that we still say today. So again, we, we're running through centuries and we're talking about some of the great leaders. Of course, there are many, many more themes and decrees and ordinances that we did not include, but that gives a little bit of a flavor of what themes were like. And then, of course, the temple is destroyed, and that is a major threat to Jewish continuity. Jewish people led into exile, into Babylon, and it takes 70 years. Over the course of 70 years, we have the Purim story. And finally, a small group of Jews go back to Israel to rebuild the temple, what's known as the Second Commonwealth, the Second Temple. At this juncture, we have a very important body called the Men of the Great Assembly. This is a temporarily expanded Sanhedrin at this very critical juncture in our history. We have the temple. It's being rebuilt, but the second temple is not going to have all the accoutrements of the first temple. The second temple is going to be a shell of its former glory. The Jews are scattered. Prophecy is waning. There are existential threats facing our nation. And this body is going to make pivotal innovations that endure until today. So the formalized prayer... That came from the men of the Great Assembly. They restored the verbiage of the prayers that were changed by Jeremiah and by Daniel. Jeremiah and Daniel actually edited some of the prayers, and that was restored by the men of the Great Assembly. The Festival of Purim, that was instituted by the men of the Great Assembly. The finalization of the canon, to include the recently written Book of Esther as the 24th book, That was done by the men of the Great Assembly. There are no longer any more books that can be added to the canon. Ezra is one of the heads of this Great Assembly. In fact, it's considered to be his court. And he's the author of 10 decrees. I don't want to go through them all, but for example, the reading of the Torah on Shabbos by Mincha, the fact that when we read the Torah on Mondays and Thursdays, it has to be three aliyos, with a minimum of three verses apiece. And this is found in the Talmud book of Baba Kama, a list of all the ten decrees that were enacted by Ezra. Some of them sound really interesting. Like, for example, Ezra decreed that there have to be merchants who travel from town to town selling jewelry and selling perfume to make sure that women have access to those items and make them more desirable by their husbands and therefore maintain marital harmony. So we have, again, this process, the system given to us by Moshe, and it's being done throughout the generations, making sure that Torah is being maintained, if necessary, adding decrees and ordinances and perpetuating Torah to future generations. Now, what happens when... There is the decree. Is there any way to have it rescinded? Is there any way to take an existing decree 
and undoing it and annulling it? That's a very interesting question. So the Talmud tells us that a court cannot annul the decree of a second court unless it is greater than the first court in number and in wisdom. So if you want to have a second court that undoes the ruling of the first court, they have to be equal or greater in scholarship and stature to the first court. So if we wanted to give get rid of some of these decrees, we would not be able to do it because we have no court today that is anywhere near the size and the scholarship of any of these previous courts. However, there is another way that a decree can be annulled, and that is if it was not accepted by all of Israel. So the Talmud, for example, tells us that Daniel, he made a decree against wine of non-Jews. He didn't want Jews frolicking with non-Jews. And therefore he said, okay, if the wine was touched by a non-Jew, can't drink from it. And that was a way to keep the Jewish people separate and unique. But he also made a decree against oil of the non-Jews. And the Talmud says, wait a minute, future generations were using Gentile oil. So if Daniel made a decree against wine and oil, how come future generations were maintaining the decree against the wine, but not against the oil? And the Talmud says, because this decree against Gentile oil was not accepted amongst the majority of Israel, and therefore it really never had any grounds. And this again reveals to us that there are some checks, there are some limitations on what a Jewish court and a Jewish sage can enact if it's not accepted by all of Israel or by the majority of Israel, then it really doesn't ever get off. I want to point out an interesting example of this. The Talmud says that there was a decree against listening to music. Why? Because ever since the temple was destroyed, it's improper for us to be joyous. It's improper for us to listen to music. I happen to not like music because I don't like it. But there's no religious requirement or prohibition against listening to music. It's it's astonishingly rare to find someone that refrains from listening to music, even though Talmud says explicitly you cannot listen to music. After the temple is destroyed, how could you have any joy? And the reason why this decree never really got started is because it wasn't accepted by the Jewish people. And therefore, it's not forbidden. This will be similar to Daniel's oil decree. It never got off the ground because it was never accepted by the Jewish people. During the three weeks between... 17th day of Tammuz, and the ninth day of Av, days of mourning, we actually do refrain from music, not because it's a new decree, but because there is such an intensity of the feeling of mourning over the temple being destroyed during these weeks, therefore, the Jewish nation has accepted the prohibition against music during these three weeks. And finally, there is a third way for a decree to be rescinded, and that if it was a temporary decree, such as the prohibition against moving nearly anything that was instituted by Nehemiah, that is uh, Ezra's counterpart. This is told in the book of Shabbos, page 123b. He made a prohibition against moving items on Shabbos because he felt the people were being a little bit too lax with touching things on Shabbos. And they weren't focusing on what Shabbos really is all about. And they were touching things that were prohibited. He says, okay, don't touch anything. And then once people kind of went to one extreme, and they became more meticulous and fastidious about Torah law and about Shabbos, he says, okay, now we can loosen up restrictions because it was only a temporary decree. So this brings us a lot closer to, to modern times. We have about a thousand years from Moshe until the men of the Great Assembly, We have a system that works very, very well, almost perfectly. And in fact, we don't find any mistakes, any any disputes, any disagreements within the nation from the time of Moshe until the men of the Great Assembly and the beginning of the Second Commonwealth. 
And at this juncture, things are okay. There are going to be several issues that are going to crop up. We're going to have a major movement, starts off small, but mushrooms out of control, of people that begin to contest rabbinic law and oral Torah. They are known as the Sadducees, and they become a growing body of Jews that reject this system. Moreover, we're going to have the nation being controlled by very hostile foreign leaders. And we're going to have systematic efforts to stop Torah from flourishing. We're going to have vacuums of leadership. We're going to have periods of tremendous unrest. And of course, we're going to have the destruction of the Second Temple. And all these factors that, please God, we'll discuss next time are going to lead to maybe, arguably, the most important, the most consequential decision of of all of Jewish history, they're going to lead to the writing down or the beginning of the writing down of the Mishnah and the Oral Torah. And of course, that's going to lead to the writing down of the Talmud. And that's going to change how Torah and Oral Torah is going to be studied. But that's the subject of, of our next discussion to understand, okay, we got basically unscathed from Moshe to the Man of the Great Assembly. What now? How do we go Or what are the factors that are going to contribute to the writing of the Mishnah? How was that done? What is this process of trying to assimilate all of oral Torah and organize it into six or three different books? Who are the personalities? What are the struggles that they faced? What were the first disputes that actually happened? There was one dispute that lingered for hundreds of years, and it wasn't resolved until many, many centuries after it was raised. We're going to talk about the splitting of the academy into the academy of Shammai and to the academy of Hillel. And how did that contribute towards this grave need of Torah being codified and formalized and canonized? So those are some of the discussions that we will have, please God, next time. As always, my email address is rabbiwalbajim.com. I look forward to hearing any questions, any comments, any feedback of any kind. I deeply appreciate it.